It's a great honor to be here and share with you this morning um, from the Word of God. Trust me, you don't want to hear my own opinion about things. Uh, and it's really important that we understand that in these uh, times of so much uncertainty and confusion and mostly deception, if you're not holding on to the Word of God, you will find yourself like some of the disciples, and we will look into what they went through that Sunday morning after the resurrection. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. Your word is true. And we ask you now to sanctify us by that truth. We ask that uh, you will speak to us today. You will convict us as well as encourage us and give us the strength and the comfort that we need in order to walk in these days. The days are evil, the Bible says, but we know that with you we can walk in peace and we can walk with the power that we can only get from above. We thank you and we bless you in the name of the Holy One of Israel. Yeshua HaMashiach, Jesus, we pray. Amen. 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 So, the title of the message this morning is The Days of Ezekiel. Because I truly believe we live in unbelievable times that the prophets of 2,700 years ago were more accurate in the way they describe what's going on today than our own newspapers even today. And um, I've never seen the church more divided in my entire life. I've never seen families more divided. I've never seen friendships so easily broken uh, as if they don't matter anymore. And all of that because the enemy successfully breached those fortresses of our lives and managed to convince us there are, that there are things that are way more important than the Bible and the gospel. And so um, it's important to me that we all understand that sometimes the bad times are not as bad as we think. And also, sometimes we need to understand that there's not a single verse in the Bible, not even one, where Jesus says, to his disciples, as you reach towards the end, things are going to be great. <laughs> I don't know why everybody's so shocked and so surprised. I mean, on one hand, they all agree that we live in the end times. On the other hand, we don't want to bear the consequences thereof. No, you can't have them both. If you think and you know and you're convinced that we live in the end times, then you have to understand that 2,700 years ago, as well as 2,000 years ago, we were promised what the end times are going to look like. I don't agree with that. Well, that's your problem. <laughs> it's not, I mean, God, by his grace, allowed us to understand in order for us to be ready how the end times are going to be. We must have a biblical perspective and not a what I would say, a sensational one. We have to be very, very careful. Because nowadays, Christians, they fight more for other things than for the gospel. They share more other things than Bible verses or ways to be saved. Because there's only one way. I see the name of Dr. Fauci more than the name of Jesus on all of their posts. <laughs> What happened to us? We must understand the times and the seasons in which we live. And for that, we must go to the Word of God, because only through the Word of God you understand where you are. The Bible says that at the very end there will be so much deception. But the biggest deception is that there are other things that are more important and more relevant than the Bible. That's the biggest deception. You know, I'm reminded of 
Luke 24, it's the first day of the week. Jesus resurrected. Happy day, no? Well, the women comes to the tomb early in the morning. At least in John, we know that Mary came to the tomb and she was in tears. And when she saw the empty tomb, she was even in more tears. Where is he? And then when Jesus appeared right next to her, he says, why are you crying? And she said, she thought he's the gardener. She said, listen, if you took the body of my Lord, tell me where it is, I will take it back. Not a single time in this whole conversation was the resurrection even an option. And if that's not enough, those women went back to the upper room to tell the rest of them, you know, we've seen an amazing thing. The tomb is empty, the stone is rolled. I mean, there's no one there. And we even saw Angel told, telling us that he's not there because he's alive. He's risen. And which type of dance do you think the, 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 the male disciples started dancing? <laughs> no dance. They actually started a, a sprint run. I mean, all the way towards the tomb. Why? Because we don't believe the woman. <laughs> we don't have a clue what they were having for breakfast. <laughs> what time of the month it is. So we run and check. And when they ran and checked, you know what the Bible says? They went, they went and they found it just as the woman had said. <laughs> Should have believed them. So the Bible tells us that John outran Peter, because it's important. But Peter entered the tomb first. But the bottom line was that the tomb was empty. Amen. And what kind of a dance they started then? None. The Bible says that they went back to the upper room perplexed at what they have seen. Scratching their head like that. And I know that they were not happy. I know that they were sad, angry, confused. I know. How do I know that? Because later on the Bible says, behold, two of them, in Luke chapter 24, two of them were traveling that same day to a village called Emmaus, which was seven miles from Jerusalem. And they talked together of all these things which had happened. I think they didn't talk about all the things. They talked about the things they saw with their eyes and not the things that they heard and had to believe in. So, by the way, Exactly the picture of the church today. 100%. People don't hold on to the things that were promised. They hold on to what they see. And, and it says, so it was while they converse and reason that Jesus himself. I love how the Bible says Jesus himself. It's not like just the spirit of Jesus, an angel that may have looked like him. It's, it's Jesus himself. The Bible says, he drew near and went with them. Now, that's kind of spooky, but think about it. You go to your friend's funeral, and on the plane back home, he's sitting right next to you. <laughs> so, their eyes, the Bible says, were restrained, so that they did not know him. And, and he said to them, what kind of conversation in this that you have with one another as you walk in what? You're sad. See, I didn't make it up. Jesus could see that everything they talk about, Sunday morning, after they already heard the news that the tomb is empty, they are sad. And everywhere I go, I see Christians sad, angry. They want to kill someone. And then he asked them the question, and, and the, then one of those whose name was Cleophas answered and said to him, are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Think about it. He's talking to Jesus right now. <laughs> are you the only stranger in Jerusalem? Have you not known the things which happen in these days? And I love how Jesus asks, what things? <laughs> what is more important than me being alive right next to you right now? What things? So they said to him, the things. 
concerning Jesus of Nazareth. Now watch how they talk to Jesus about Jesus. Watch this. Are you ready? Because they switch to past tense. Jesus of Nazareth, who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and the people. And how the chief priests and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. That's it. He's done. Indeed. Besides all this, today is the... Th Let me... Is it better? Besides all this, the Bible says, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, and certain women, again, back to the women, certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us when they did not find his body and they came saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he was alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it what? Just as the woman had said. But him they did not see. And then Jesus said, okay, time out. Look at me. And he's not talking to the governor, to the state legislators. He's not talking to the Jewish leadership. He's not talking to some family member. He's talking to his disciples. Watch this, because this is what God is telling us today also. He's saying to them, oh, foolish ones and slow of heart to believe in what? All. Say all. 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 In all that the prophets have spoken. See why I love Bible prophecy so much? Because Jesus is rebuking his own disciples for not believing all that the prophets have spoken. He says, that's exactly why you are so sad. Ought not the Christ to have suffered these things and to enter into his glory? Shouldn't suffering and, and some, some terrible things accompany, according to the word of God, the end times? I want my rights back. While you're holding your Starbucks in your hand. Do you understand that as I speak right now, right now, hundreds are being executed in Afghanistan by the Taliban. Right now, right now, 12-year-olds are being kidnapped from their homes and being as meat supplied to the jihadists. Right now, anything that has a female figure or, you know, a, a, you know, painting of a woman or picture of a woman anywhere around Kabul is being sprayed right now. That's it. The end. Will you hear anything condemning, condemning that from the progressive liberals? Of course not. Right now, Christians or anyone in Afghanistan that professes Christianity is being executed as we speak. And you tell me that your rights are being taken from you? My father-in-law is teaching every week Afghans from a different rooftop every week. They're on a, they don't have a church. They go on a rooftop with a, where they, they have some cell reception. And there is not a single week where they're in the same rooftop of the one before. A little perspective is needed in these days. And we don't even know if they're alive today. And beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures. Jesus did not quote any other document. Not even 
the Constitution. Beginning at Moses and all the prophets, he expounded to them in all the scriptures the teachings concerning himself. Basically, he said, I'm everywhere in the scriptures. Of course, there are some churches that don't teach the Old Testament, so Jesus is nowhere. Because Jesus showed them everywhere he is in the Old Testament. Well, Jesus never taught from the New Testament even one sermon. What are you talking about, Willis? <laughs> Think about it. Paul never quoted the New Testament even once. Every time the Bible, in the Bible, talks about scriptures, it's the Old Testament. Some Christians are being handed, you know, New Testament and Psalms. I hope you paid half price. It's a half of the Bible. And the Bible says, then they drew near to the village where they were going, and he indicated that he would have gone farther. But they constrained him, saying, abide with us, for it is towards evening, and the day is far spent. Abide with us. And he went in. Well, was there a time that people asked him to be, to heal, to stay, and he says, Ah, uh, no, I don't think so. No. Now watch this. And he came to pass that he sat at the table with them, that he took bread, blessed, broke it, and he gave it to them. And that was a deja vu. They realized, okay, now we know this one. <laughs> and their eyes were open, and they knew him. And he what? <laughs> Gone. Do you have a problem with us being vanished? <laughs> Taken away? No, because this is biblical, you know that. <laughs> and they said to one another, did not our heart burn with one, within us while he talked with us and on the road and while he opened the scriptures to us? Now, did Jesus own a Bible? No. Did he walk with, was he walking with a Bible? No. He is the word of God. Everything he spoke was the word of God. He knows the word of God and he expounded the scriptures to them in ways that they never ever heard before because there is no rabbinical interpretation involved. There is no, there, no other, uh, you know, some uh, commentary involved. That, that's it. It was pure, the word of God speaking the word of God to the people that never heard the word of God spoken like that before. And they rose up. Remember, it was too dangerous to walk in the evening in those days. They actually told him, look, the day is far spent. Stay with us. Not just because we love you, because it's dangerous outside. And they rose up that very hour when their eyes were open. When they understood, man, it had to have happened. He is alive. And they are running all the way to Jerusalem. And they are hoping to surprise the disciples by saying, we've seen him. And guess what? They found the eleven and those who were with them gathered together saying, The Lord is risen indeed and has appeared to Simon. And they're like, wait a minute. He appeared to us also. We wanted to give you the news. And they told them about the things that happened on the road and how he was known to them in the breaking of bread. Amazing story. But I'm reminded that it is the disciples that did not believe the words of the prophets. Thus, they did not understand who Jesus and what Jesus is all about. And they were angry, humiliated, sad, and confused. They thought we wasted three years on this guy. And what? He's dead. No, he's not dead. Not only that he's alive, he is talking to you right now. <laughs> See, God wants us to know the end from the beginning. Everything that is going to happen, God saw it happening already. 
God is above time. <laughs> He's not sitting and, oh, will he attack, not attack? I'm going to be surprised. No, God saw it all happening and thankfully sent us an email with an attachment. <laughs> that is what is going to happen. Remember the former things of old, he says through the prophet Isaiah. For I am God, there is no other. I am God, there is none like me. Declaring the end from the beginning. God is not hiding. He is declaring the end from the beginning. And from ancient times, things that are not yet done. Some major things have not yet done. I mean, some places that should be gone are still standing. And he says, my counsel shall stand and I will do all my pleasure. You don't surprise God. You don't take him, you know, he's not knocked off his throne just because someone decided to take over Afghanistan right now. Are you out of your mind? Are we out of our mind? Do, you, do we really think that God is surprised? God told us what is going to happen. God understands the way men think. This is why he had to send his only begotten son. Because, you know, it took us three chapters from the moment sin entered the world to the point that God said, I'm sorry I even created this world. Three chapters. We are very fast. We are very, very uh, creative and, and I would say um, talented. Three chapters. We messed it up. Knowing this first, he says, no prophecy of Scripture is of any private interpretation for prophecy Say never. never. Never came by the will of man. But holy men of God spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit. When the prophets wrote their words, it's not their own interpretation. And most of the times it wasn't even their own idea to, 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 to write those things. But it's the Holy Spirit that moved through them. So what are the days of Ezekiel? Because uh, God spoke to us through the prophets in many, many different ways. Isaiah the prophet is the prophet God used to lead me to the Lord. I mean, I read Isaiah 7, Isaiah 9, and then Isaiah 11. And, and to top all of that, Isaiah 53 is the chapter that changed my life. I couldn't... I, look, up until today, it's known as the forbidden chapter. But rabbis cannot even deal with that chapter. It's a chapter that spoke of the fact that there was a need for God's, for the Messiah to come and, 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 and die for the sake of the sins of the world. So what are the days of Ezekiel? Ezekiel is a unique prophet to whom God revealed the days in which we live today. It's very interesting. In a very wonderful series of chapters, we are seeing an, an, an amazing and an accurate picture of the last, I guess, 100 years or so. For the, the last 2,000 years, Israel was gone from their land. Israel was gone and the land was dead and the language was dead. Everything was dead there. And that enabled and fueled up all the new theologies that God has done with Israel. That the church has replaced Israel. Because look, they're not there yet. And if there's one thing that God was concerned about is His name. And what the nations are going to see when they see Israel spread all around. And a hundred years ago, when we came back to the land, the land was so dead that even the mosquitoes says, Adios, amigos. <laughs> I mean, take a look at this. It was so dead that the cactus, which is a great friend of the desert, said, I'm not growing there. This is too much for me. Mark Twain shows up in the middle of the 1800s. He writes a book and he says, I, I couldn't even see a single living soul there. Barren wasteland. And Ezekiel says in chapter 36, in preparation, you know how the flight attendants say, in preparation for landing, please fold your table, all of these things. Ezekiel says, in preparation for the return of the Jews, God says, and I speak to you, O mountains of Israel, shoot forth your branches and yield your fruit for my people Israel, for they are about to come. And guess what? Israel, I mean, this is it. We can feed ourselves today. We don't need the help of any other country. 
Ladies and gentlemen, and while we look at these green, beautiful fields of, of, of stuff that did not exist in Israel before, while we look at it, we must remember that as you go into chapter 37 of Ezekiel, you actually see that Ezekiel was brought to a valley full of dry bones. And Ezekiel was asking, Lord, what is this? And the Lord said to him, Ezekiel, this is the entire house of Israel. They say our bones are dry, our hope is lost, and we ourselves have been cut off. Tell them they are my people, and I have not done with them. And I, I, for, for, for so long I was trying to figure, what is it that Ezekiel may have seen? What is it that could show you some, someone who is alive, but yet he has dry bones, no flesh? And, and when I saw the picture of when we came to liberate the death camps in Europe, I realized, look, they have no hope in their eyes. Look at them. There's no flesh almost. It's skin and bones. And these are, that's the generation that God rescued. And then God said in the same chapter, I will take you out of that graveyard. And I will place you in your own land. And he calls that land Israel, not Palestine. Hallelujah. 2020, the year of the pandemic, and 20,000 new immigrants from, from over 60 different countries still kept coming to Israel. God is still in the business of bringing them from all over the world. I mean, look to your left. That's a 747 jumbo jet where we crammed 1,000 Ethiopians when we saved them in the 1980s. Two babies were born on board. <laughs> Thankfully, they were slim enough to, you know, think about it. 1,000 in one jumbo jet. Ladies and gentlemen, we're in the business of bringing the Jews from the four corners of the world do you have something like that in America where you have your central intelligence uh, uh, agency busy bringing all the Americans from the four corners of the world? You're bringing everybody but Americans into it. I'm telling you, I could have voted here a few months ago. And I'm not even American. Listen, what I'm trying to say is that there is no country like that on planet Earth. And it's because... God is directing those steps. And he promised that. So the preparation of the land is fulfilled. The rescue of the remnant is fulfilled. The return to the land, not only you rescue them, but you bring them physically back to the land. It's also being fulfilled. In Israel today, believe it or not, we are this in our, in the state right now of Israel is its safest and the most secure and most prosperous it has ever been. Oh, I thought there were some rockets flying towards it. Yeah, so we take care of business. We shoot them down and 10% of all those rockets fall on them anyway. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, this is by far the safest decade we've ever had in our history. Just so you know. And we know our enemy. It's very easy. So you go and take care of business. The problem is when you don't know your enemy. I want you to know that God is, is working in amazing ways. In his. Look, let's talk about water for a second, okay? I was brought to a farm in Israel. They, they showed me a pool full of water. They said, guess how deep it is? I thought it's three feet. She said, it's 30. It's 10 meters deep. And I'm like, what? She said, yes, you can taste it. I taste, wow, very good. She said, good, I just flushed the water in the toilet. Just, I said, what? She said, yes, it's a new technology. I flush the water. The dirty water comes down to a pool. The pool has water plants covered with plants. They start cleaning. It moves down to another pool with different water plants, then to a third pool with another set of water plants. Each pool has its own water plants. They clean in a different phase. By the fourth one, it's clean, you can drink. Not even a need for any chemicals and, or not even electricity, just flows down, that's it. 
And she said, you want to try it again? I said, no, no, I'm okay. I, I had enough. Just the thought that, you know. But I'm saying Israel became a regional water superpower. Take a look at this. It's the world's leader in water reclamation with 87% of its wastewater undergoing purification and reuse for agriculture. As of uh, 2020, 25% of Israel's water usage is from, natural, um, is, is from the natural water resources, so like the Sea of Galilee and the aquifers. But the rest, look, we're taking it from anything else. It's quite amazing. What about energy? We found trillions of cubic feet of natural gas off the coast of Israel. Take a look at the, off the coast of Israel. These are all the gas fields we found. And trust me, the Lebanese tried, they couldn't find. The Tur Turkish tried, they couldn't find. I mean, all of our friends in the area, even, even Syria, they, didn't, they couldn't find anything. Thankfully, our friends found, like Cyprus and Greece. Ladies and gentlemen, out of 365 days a year, 320 are sunny days in Israel. Sounds familiar? Hello? You guys, I mean, I don't get it. It's sunny, and then it's just torrential rains, and then sunny again. It's like, I'm confused. We were driving yesterday through three seasons. <laughs> well, in Israel, because of the sunshine oh, most of the year, look at what we have. Solar tower that looks like out of the future with, with tons of panels that provide so much of our elect electricity. Right now, it's 8%. It will be... 20% by 2025, or maybe 30% by 2030. What about food? What about food? You know, while farm workers made up only 3.7% of the workforce, Israel produced 95% of its own food requirements. And that was in 2000, in, I think in eight, yeah. Like, look at 2020, 10 Israeli companies listed among top 50 global agri- agri-tech in the food tech uh, firms in Israel, in, uh, in, around the world. Take a look. 10 out of the 50 all around the world are Israeli. Now, I'm not bragging here. I'm just telling you God is faithful. He did not bring us all the way back to our land to destroy us. The way he brought us, the timing he brought us, and how he sustains us is a fulfillment of his word. Not of mine, not of yours, his word. Even militarily, we're Israel in militarily. We're number one in the Middle East, of course, but we're known to be a superpower in, in, in many ways of, of weapon systems and defense systems. Um, and, and the world acknowledges that. And so you have now uh, uh, Sunni moderate countries from, from the Gulf such as the Emirates and Bahrain and even Saudi Arabia, they're buying weapons from us. Who, who would imagine? They're buying weapons from us. What about technological advantages? Israel became a cybersecurity superpower. I don't need to tell you why you need cybersecurity nowadays. We just found documents that Iran is, is having access to most of the most important infrastructures in America. So you know, they can actually, w with one single push of a button, they can cause a gas station to operate or not to operate. And now I want you to understand, we live in, a, in an area where we see geopolitical developments. Russia. How many of you heard of Russia? <laughs> Good. Well, Russia right now is on the border with Israel. Russia made a move into Syria. We hear Russian when we listen to what's going on beyond our border. Russia wants to restore Syria, but they realize it's not going to happen. They've been there for seven years. Six years completed, now it's the seventh year. Iran is at our border. The Iranians may have no food for their people, no electricity for their people, maybe no hospital beds for their people, but all the money they have, they, they, they invest in weapons and in training militia forces so they can destabilize the Middle East. Iran is on our border. Turkey is already in Syria as well. I just want you to understand, 
Ezekiel saw that 2,700 years ago. Ezekiel prophesied right after chapter 36 and 37 comes 38 and 39. Last time I checked. And that's a looming war in the Middle East. And for that war to happen, trust me, America cannot be a great superpower that will stand and defend Israel. Well, during the 45th, none of this would have happened. You know that. But the 45th was replaced by the 46th, which I hope he knows he's the president. <laughs> but that's a different story. But I can tell you, you better smell the coffee and wake up. There's a new guy in the White House, and the Middle East knows that. What you see in Afghanistan today, and what you are seeing with Iran, and what you are seeing in Iraq, and what you are seeing in so many other places, such as Lebanon, is a direct consequence of the change that was in the White House not long ago. Make no mistake. Now, has God lost control? Absolutely not. Didn't we know that this is going to happen? We sure did. So are we surprised? No. Did we enjoy 45th? Yes. Do we love what we see now? No. Do we have to like everything? No. Why? Because, look, if the disciples 2,000 years ago in, would insist on only enjoying the things they see, and live the moment, and not understand the big picture, they would have rejected Christ. Christ rebuked with love. He stayed with them. He broke bread with them. He expounded all the scriptures for them. I mean, it's what, it wasn't like, you know, he punished them. No. With love, he rebuked them. And he said, you are foolish ones. And you are slow of heart, not to hear the word, but to believe in the word. We see countries like Sudan and countries like Libya that are becoming the proxies of both Iran and Russia and Turkey, and they're also waiting for a move. On the other hand, you see Sheba and Dedan in the Bible that are Saudi Arabia and the Gulf states that are now swinging towards the state of Israel on our side. And in that book and in that chapter of that war, Sheba and Dedan together with the merchants of Tarshish and the young lions of Tarshish that should probably be Europe, and some suggest, could also suggest uh, America, I'm not sure, but I can only tell you this, they are criticizing the coming war and the reason for which those countries are invading into Israel. In other words, for the first time, a Muslim Arab Sunni country is actually criticizing what is going to be predominantly Islamic invasion. Amazing. 45th, within the last few months, brought the Abraham Accords. And when you look at that, you realize they were required and needed for Sheba and Dedan to switch sides. They were signed at the White House, and we understand that from one administration to the other, the person in the White House affects the entire Middle East. And I'm not a political person. I don't belong to any political party in America. In fact, I, I, I find them both corrupt. This is exactly why the 45th couldn't even, you know, swim in the own swamp of his own party. But I can tell you that he, he brought peace with four countries. At least three others have either formally recognized Israel or even opened an embassy there. Arabs and Jews are cooperating on a level we've never seen before. A white, that was a White House that holds the Middle East accountable results, and, and, and it resulted in less violence. It was the, the most peaceful year we've had. Yes, some people counted him as crazy. Well, you need to be crazy in order to deal with a crazy area of the world. In just a matter of months following his uh, departure from the White House, Israel knows it no longer has reliable support from the White House. We know that. The U.S. has gone back to negotiating with Iran, the world's number one sponsor of terror. I'm saying that, by the way. I'm quoting news agencies and security agencies in Israel. 
While one president brought about stability and relationships that Ezekiel describes, another one brings apathy that is allowing for the hostility that is needed for the coming invasion. In other words, both somehow plays into the prophetic picture of what we see today. I want my 45th back. Well, uh, God is in control. It's almost like the disciples will say, I don't like that we can when Jesus was uh, crucified. Well, I'm sorry, but he had to. You know, not everything we want, we get. Everything God wants, we get. You understand that? Yeah, but what about... God is not asking us. It's not a menu. Which one do you prefer tomorrow? He sent us an email with an attachment of what has already happened as far as he is concerned. He already saw everything. In his infinite way of seeing everything, the Bible says, declaring the end from the beginning. How could he declare the end from the beginning? Unless he knows. Hello? He says, we are the only group of people on planet Earth that our book contains almost a third of future events. And why is it? Because God knows it's going to happen. He warns us. He wants us to know the times and the seasons in which we live. He wants us to warn one another and comfort one another at the same time. What you see is what God already told us is going to happen. So there's a great confusion in the church around uh, today about uh, what is going to happen. There's Psalm 83, Isaiah 17, Ezekiel, Zechariah, Revelation. Let, let Let me put it all in order. Psalm 83 is a psalm that was describing the war of independence in Israel. It talked about the first tier of countries that came right when Israel declared statehood. And what did they want? To cut us off from being a nation that the name of Israel will be remembered no more. They wanted Palestine to remain remain the name. It's already been fulfilled. We're no longer looking at the first tier of countries. We have peace with Egypt. We have peace with Jordan. And literally, Lebanon and Syria cease to exist as sovereign countries. Now, we have a different scope, the second tier. Countries that don't border with Israel, such as Iran and Turkey and and Russia and others. They don't have borders with Israel. The first tier knows it failed. The second tier don't know yet. They will make a move. And Isaiah 17 is an amazing, it's a prophecy that falls into the description of things that have not yet done. The burden against Damascus, behold, Damascus will cease from being a city and it will be a ruinous heap. Take a look at what Damascus looked like today. It's a huge metropolis. It's the oldest standing city in the world. It has never been utterly, totally destroyed. But the Bible says it it will be so destroyed that nobody will be able to live there. It will be uninhabitable. And I know, and you know, that when the interests of Iran and of Russia and of, of Turkey are all in Damascus, if Damascus will be destroyed, guess who is going to be blamed for it? Exactly. Listen, they blame us for everything. There are fires in Algeria right now. Fires, forest fires in Algeria. And all their cartoons is that Israel set the fire. I want you to all understand, this is it. We've reached the finish line as far as we're concerned. We are seeing the day approaching. The Bible is telling us, Jesus made it very clear that the generation that is seeing the fig tree coming back to life is a generation that shall not pass away. As far as I know, I look at you, you are the generation. Israel is back to life. And the Bible says, now when these things begin to happen, say begin. They begin to happen. Look up and lift up your heads because what? Your redemption draws near. What redemption? I thought I'm redeemed. The redemption of the body. Which body? Your body. Look at it. (laughs) This body 
You can train five times in the gym every day. It'll have to stay here. <laughs> Flesh and blood cannot enter the kingdom of God. You understand that? The, that's why Paul said, Behold, I tell you a mystery. Not all of us may sleep, but all of us have to change. Say goodbye to all of those back aches. God will give you a new body. The Bible says this corruption will wear incorruption. This mortal body will wear immortality. Amazing. And Luke even goes on and says, when you also, when you see these things happening, when these things are already happening and we're not here, know that the kingdom of God is near. That means that he's going to come back and establish his kingdom. Of course, the millennial kingdom. And I know, I know it's hard for you to understand it. And the scoffers are everywhere saying, where is the promise of his coming? Since the day of creation, things are the same. And Peter says to them, well, you're just like that generation before the flood. They just, just they looked at Noah. They said, what are you doing? It's all the same. And Noah knew the flood is coming. He was busy building his ark. And they ridiculed him. And he was doing God's business. He was a, a, um, he was a, a worker of righteousness, the Bible says. He's preaching righteousness. So I want to conclude with Romans 13. Do this knowing the time. That now it is high time to awake out of sleep. Now our salvation, remember salvation of the body, is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. We're still in the night. It's far spent, but we're still in the night. The day is at hand, but it hasn't started yet. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us... Put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day. Although we're in the night right now, we are not of the night. And we should wear the things of the day. We should walk as in the day. And, and I, I, I want you all to understand, things are going to get way more difficult than they are right now. You need to understand that. Jesus said, in this world you will have what? Tribulations. Tribulations. But be of good cheer. Jesus is not going to allow his bride to go through the tribulation. For, you have to, listen. Wait. Listen. The tribulation has not yet begun. If you think this is the tribulation, oh my goodness. This is nothing. You go out and go and grab a cup of coffee and sit in a restaurant, go to the, that's the tribulation. <laughs> Do you need to read again the book of Revelation to understand what is going to happen to this world during the tribulation? Okay, now it's nothing compares to what the tribulation is going to be. And even when things will get even harder and harder, it is for us to get readier and readier. But we, the Bible says, he will take us from, he will save us from the hour of trial that is about to come upon this earth dwellers. You understand? We are not destined to the wrath of God. You understand that? God, by his grace, revealed to us his word. In Israel, by the way, not only that God has a, a love for the people of Israel, but he has a love for you. That's why you can never be the fig tree. You are the generation that is watching the fig tree. You're not the fig tree. You may be part of the olive tree, you may be part of the vine, but not part of the fig. The fig tree is Israel's national privileges. Their state, their capital, their future temple, everything that has to do with the land and their identity as Israelis. You understand? When you're becoming a believer, you're not becoming Israelis. <laughs> you may now belong to the family of God, now you are... Believe in the God of Israel. Now the Old Testament is also your word of God, okay? But you're not Israelis. But you see Israel. You see the fig tree coming back to life. And he said, that generation shall not pass away. 
Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you that you gave us your word to encourage us, to comfort us. You said comfort one another with these things. We thank you that concerning the times and the seasons, there is no need for you to, te- to write to us because we should know perfectly. Father, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction is going to come upon them. Father, we understand that the days are evil. We understand that the prince of this world, the ruler of this world, is not happy with us. And we know that there is not a better day for him than to see us out of here so he can really start confusing and ruling this world through the man to whom he is going to give his authority, power, and seat. We thank you, Father, that we do not need to wait for the Antichrist, but we are waiting for Jesus Christ. We thank you that we have a meeting place in the clouds. We are going to meet the Lord in the air. And we thank you for his promise to us that he prepared a place for us so he can come and receive us unto himself so where he is, we will be also. We thank you for that amazing promise that is so ridiculed, so abused, and so ignored from pulpits all around the world, yet we hold on to that promise of our soon departure. Jesus will come back for us, but not for the world. He will come to take us out of this world. And then when he will come back to this world, it will be not for us, but with us. We thank you, Father, that in the second coming of Jesus, we will see his back, not his face, as we are riding those white horses behind him. We thank you, Father, that as he comes back to judge this world, we will judge with him, rule with him, reign with him, and be with him. We have a great promise. We bless your name for all of these promises that we have. And so far, Father, the experts are wrong. Your word is right. So we thank you for your word. Your word again, again, and again is true. And we thank you that we can sanctify ourselves by that truth. And may you all stand up. I want to bless you in in the ironic blessing in the Hebrew language. Yevarechecha Adonai Vishmerecha Yaer Adonai Panavelecha Vichuneka Yisa Adonai Panavelecha Vyasemecha Shalom. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance towards you and give you his peace. That peace that surpasses all understanding that can only come from the Prince of Peace who is the Lord of Peace who can give you peace now and forever here and everywhere. His name is Yeshua. He's our salvation. He's Jesus. And it's in His name we pray. And all of God's people say, Amen. Amen. Thank you and God bless you.